You are tuned in to This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air, now celebrating our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1201 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The situation in the Ukraine tops our news this week as amateur radio operators in that country continue to be off the air as amateurs there maintain radio silence. Elon Musk ships truckloads of Starlink downlink antennas to the Ukraine to help maintain internet connectivity there. Meanwhile, Ukraine and Russian radio enthusiasts battle over alleged Russian military frequencies. The BBC and others resurrect mothballed shortwave facilities and began shortwave and medium wave broadcasts to the Ukraine to help keep people there informed. In other amateur news this week, the AWRL has filed for an exemption from the proposed U.S. Forest Service facility fees for amateurs and commercial operators. Ham Exposition 2022, formerly known as Boxborough, will host the AWRL New England and Hudson Division conventions. The Volunteer Monitor Program is cautioning amateurs against operating outside of your license privileges. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel says the Commission will consider receivers in a newly proposed Notice of Inquiry due out in April. And the youngest amateur in Germany gets her advanced class license. We will introduce you to her. All of this and a lot more is straight ahead on today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will have an expanded segment talking about technology, the Internet, Starlink, the International Space Station, and the Ukraine. We will have an expanded report from him this week. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, asks, what happens when you plug it in? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a close-up look at the predecessor to the emergency broadcast system, which was called Connellrad. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, begins the first of a four-part series on how to successfully get a public service message promoting your club meetings or ham fest on local broadcast radio stations. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the sleepy little town of Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson. W-A-2-H-O-Y. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from a sunny but still frigid Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, Kilo Delta 2, Romeo, Juliet X-Ray. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it was 84 degrees last Thursday, and the forecast is for a high of 45 degrees this Monday. Hmm, enough said. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off our news this week, radio amateurs in Ukraine appear to be diligently maintaining radio silence as the state of emergency declared there just prior to the Russian military invasion remains in effect. With more details on this story, we go across the Atlantic to the UK, where Steve Richards, G4HPE, files this special report. A February the 24th decree from President Volodymyr Zelensky included a ban on the operation of amateur radio transmitters for personal and collective use. The Ukraine Amateur Radio League reported this past week that it's received many messages of encouragement from the worldwide amateur radio community. 
The Society's Vice President, Anatoly Kirilenko, Uniform Tango 3 Uniform Yankee, said that they had informed international amateur radio organisations about Russia's military invasion of Ukraine, and to date there had been many messages from radio amateurs around the world in support of Ukraine. The International Amateur Radio Union, the IARU, has adopted a neutral stance. In a statement, it said that the IARU is an apolitical organisation focused on promoting and defending amateur radio and the amateur radio services. The amateur radio service is about self-instruction in communications and friendship between people. Closer to the European area, IARU Region 1 said that it continues to monitor developments and expects all radio amateurs to follow their national laws and regulations. IARU Region 1 also reposted part of an advisory from the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club HF Committee, saying that any radio amateur currently transmitting from Ukraine is risking his or her life. The DARC's overarching advice remains that in the current situation, the best we can do is listen. Ukraine's assigned amateur radio callsign prefixes include Echo Mike Alpha to Echo Oscar Zulu and the more commonplace Uniform Romeo Alpha to Uniform Zulu Zulu. Some stations with Ukrainian call signs may still be active because an exception to the amateur radio ban was made for stations in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine, the eastern Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, which have special legal status owing to Russia's occupation there since 2014. In a Facebook post, Poland's IARU member society, the PZK, continues to offer WinLink nodes in Poland for licensed refugees. If you are a licensed amateur radio operator, you can send information via email to your relatives in Poland or the emergency services using the WinLink system, which is currently operating on three amateur HF bands. Polish WinLink nodes are active on 160, 80 and 20 meters, SR5 WLK on 3.5955 MHz, USB, SR3 WLK on 14.111 MHz USB and SP3 IEW on 1.865 MHz upper sideband. Here in the United States, W9IMS, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Amateur Radio Club, known for its special events commemorating major races at the Speedway, has posted a statement on its QRZ.com profile expressing its concern for well-known QSL maker Gennady V. Treas, UX5UO. The statement reads in part, his last email to us said, This moment we are safe, but we hear strong explosions near Kiev. Do not know what will happen in the nearest hours and days. We have not heard from him for days now. We are greatly concerned for Gennady and his family, along with all the other citizens of Ukraine. The Creek City Times reports that Elon Musk says SpaceX's Starlink satellites are now active over Ukraine after a request from the embattled country's leadership to replace internet services destroyed by the Russian attack. Vladimir Putin's unprovoked invasion has left parts of the country without internet, while SpaceX has launched thousands of communication satellites to bring broadband to hard-to-reach areas of the world. Tesla North reports Mikhail Fedorov, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine and Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, asked SpaceX CEO Elon Musk for Starlink Internet a mere 10 hours ago. Just this Saturday afternoon, Musk replied to Fedorov by saying, Starlink service is now active in Ukraine. More terminals are en route. Starlink is a satellite constellation in low Earth orbit, allowing for Internet to blanket anywhere on the planet. Users on the ground require satellite dishes that connect to Starlink satellites and ground stations for Internet. The situation in Ukraine means if Russian troops damage internet communications, government officials will be able to remain online thanks to Starlink. SpaceX is warning users in Ukraine who have received one of the company's Starlink dishes that the connection could be targeted by Russian state actors. Starlink is the only non-Russian communication system still working in some parts of Ukraine, so probability of being targeted is high, Musk tweeted on Thursday. Please use with caution, he added. It's a risk that's worth spelling out, especially given Russia's extensive history of spying on adversaries, and its current espionage efforts are as evident as ever during the nation's all-out assault on Ukraine. It's a precarious situation. With Ukraine battling with nationwide connectivity issues, re-establishing reliable communications is crucial, but Russia is likely listening in as well. SpaceX recently also helped Tonga get connected to Starlink Internet after a volcano severed the island nation's fiber-optic cable, taking communications offline.
The Kyiv Independent reports that the frequency of a suspected Russian military shortwave radio broadcast, known as the buzzer for its recognizable repeating channel marker, has become the battleground for rival Russian and Ukrainian radio enthusiasts, who have been attempting to hijack the frequency to play memes and propaganda. The UBV-76 transmission, which can be listened to at 4,625 kilohertz on shortwave radio, is suspected to be used by the Russian military for relaying coded messages to military forces. The signal has been transmitted since the late 1970s during the height of the Cold War. There has been much speculation about the exact purpose of the radio signal, However, according to Numbers Station Research and Information Center, the most widely accepted theory is that the transmissions are used to send communications between Russia's western military district. The radio signals originate from the village of Narofominsk near Moscow. The frequency is allegedly marked by the Russian military with a repeated buzz, which is occasionally interrupted by live coded messages. With tensions between Russia and Ukraine mounting, enthusiasts noted that the encrypted radio messages were becoming much more frequent. The cryptic messages can be picked up hundreds of miles away using strong antennae. Following this flurry of military radio activity, enthusiasts decided to take to the airwaves themselves, flooding the frequency with memes, propaganda, and pirated music. In response, Russian listeners began blaring the Soviet national anthem, Russian 90s rock songs, and Russian state propaganda. The frequency is now also being blocked by heavy radio jamming, possibly by the Russian military getting fed up with pirates using the frequency. As we come to air, the BBC has begun shortwave broadcasting to the Ukraine region. The BBC shortwave radio broadcasts can be found on 15,735 kilohertz from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. and on 5,875 kilohertz from midnight to 2 a.m. Ukraine time. The BBC's move to bring back shortwave came days after Russia launched two missiles on Kyiv's TV tower, killing five people and knocking out some access to news and broadcasts. With amateur radio banned in Ukraine following the Russian invasion, Broadcasts on the medium wave radio frequencies have taken on increasing importance in the past week. In the U.S., the Miami, Florida commercial shortwave station WRMI has been carrying broadcast six days a week of Radio Ukraine International, the official overseas service of Ukraine radio, on 510 kilohertz. There are no Friday broadcasts. The schedule can be found on the website at wrmi.net. There are also reports that the BBC World Service has begun carrying shortwave broadcasts directed towards Ukraine. According to the website hfunderground.com, those broadcasts began on February 24th, covering news events. In Italy, the Nexus International Broadcasting Association, an apolitical global organization, announced on its website it has increased its transmitter power on the 1323 kilohertz medium wave into Central and Southern Europe, and has a good reach into the area of conflict as well as Poland, Romania, Belarus, and Western Russia. A note on the website says we have increased our special news coverage, adding repeats of the most informational and inspirational programs in English to support displaced people and cover the latest events in Ukraine and nearby countries. The Federal Communications Commission Enforcement Bureau on February 24th has reissued an earlier enforcement advisory that licensees in the amateur radio service, as well as licensees and operators in the personal radio services, are prohibited from using radios in those services to commit or facilitate criminal acts. Yes, you heard this before, and no reason was given by the Commission as to why they chose to release it again. The Bureau recognizes that these services can be used for a wide range of permitted and socially beneficial purposes, including emergency communications and speech that is protected under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Commission said. Amateur and personal radio services, however, may not be used to commit or facilitate crimes. 
As it did in advisories in 2021, the Enforcement Bureau is reminding amateur licensees that they may not transmit communications intended to facilitate a criminal act or messages encoded for the purpose of obstructing their meaning. Likewise, individuals operating radios in the personal radio services, a category that includes citizens band radios, family radio service walkie-talkies, and general mobile radio service, are prohibited from using those radios in connection with any activity which is against federal, state, or local law. Individuals using radios in the amateur or personal radio services in this manner may be subject to severe penalties, including significant fines, seizure of the offending equipment, and in some cases, criminal prosecution. To report a crime, contact your local law enforcement office or the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FCC advised. In what may be a first, the Northeast Ham Exposition will host both the ARRL New England and Hudson Division conventions this year. With more on what promises to be an exciting new Ham Exposition, we go to Ellsworth, Maine, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Ham Exposition takes place August 26th through the 28th in Marlboro, Massachusetts, and tickets will become available on May 1st. Formerly known as Boxboro, and still called that by a lot of people in New England, the New England Division Convention features a Saturday morning keynote address, Friday and Saturday evening banquets with guest speakers, a large outdoor flea market, and ample indoor vendor space. Proceeds from the convention will benefit scholarships for both New England and Hudson Division students. Volunteers and speakers will be drawn from both divisions. Other details will be worked out as things progress. ARRL Hudson Division Director Rhea Jairam and 2RJ said that by joining forces with the New England Division for a joint convention, we can, quote, bring back a sense of nostalgia and community. New New England Division Director Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC, called it a great opportunity to expand ham exposition participation and programs and to support scholarships for young hams in both divisions. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. ARRL First Vice President Mike Raisbeck, K1TWF, predicted larger attendance than has been seen in many years. In February, FEMERA, the organization that runs Ham Exposition, voted to officially approve the unique arrangement. The combined events have received ARRL Division Convention sanctioning, approved by Directors Kemmerer and Jerome. Both are members of the Ham Exposition Convention Committee, along with New England Division Vice Director Phil Temple's K9HI, who serves as the program chair. Vice President Raisbeck is the FEMERA president and the convention's vice chair. Raisbeck said Ham Exposition will return to the venue selected for last year's event, the Best Western Royal Plaza Hotel and Trade Center in Marlboro. The new facility is everything we had hoped for. It is newer and larger than our old venue and is more centrally located with restaurants, shops, and other hotels only minutes away, he said. We have long-term commitments from the hotel, and we plan to be at this location for the foreseeable future. Visit the convention website for more information, such as how to volunteer, serve as a speaker, and take advantage of the convention discount when booking hotel reservations. Many of the advisory notices sent out each month by the ARRL Volunteer Monitor Program go to stations heard operating outside the operator's license privileges. Typical cases often involve operators holding technician or general class amateur radio licenses being heard on a frequency or band not permitted by their license privileges. Most recent incidents have frequently entailed FT8 digital mode operation by technician licensees on 20 and 40 meters. Technician licensees do not have any operating privileges on 20 meters, let alone digital privileges, and FT8 is a digital protocol. Technicians and novices may operate CW between 21.025 and 21.200 MHz on 15 meters and from 7.025 and 7.125 MHz on 40 meters and from 3.525 to 3.600 MHz on 80 meters, but they do not have any digital mode privileges on these bands. ARRL Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K1ZDH, said licensees who need a refresher course regarding their operating privileges may refer to Section 97.301 of the rules. 
ARRL also has a convenient chart on its website that details privileges available to all licensed classes from novice to amateur extra. As monthly volunteer monitor reports indicate, some general class operators have lost their way on some bands too, and advisory notices have gone out to those operating outside of general class phone subbands. For example, on 20 meters, generals may operate phone from 14.225 to 14.350 MHz, but occasionally general class operators are heard outside of that subband. On 40 meters, the phone and image subband open to general licensees is 7.175 to 7.300 MHz. Of course, technician and general class licensees may operate CW on any subband on which they have operating privileges, although operation within the CW subbands is preferred by band plan. On 10 meters, technicians have RTTY and data privileges, including FT8, from 28.000 to 28.300 MHz, and SSB phone privileges from 28.300 to 28.500 MHz, and may operate on CW over the entire 28.000 to 28.500 MHz segment. Technicians may enjoy all operating privileges at 50 MHz and above. The ARRL Volunteer Monitor Program is a formal agreement between the FCC and ARRL. Volunteers trained and vetted by ARRL monitor the airwaves and report evidence that may be used to correct errant operation or to recognize exemplary on-air operation. In case you missed the earlier announcement, Dayton Hamvention 2022 is on... Here with all the details on what's to be an exciting hamvention this year, we go to Ellsworth, Maine, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Hamvention General Chairman Rick Allnut, WSAG, said this week, he said many hamvention volunteers attended the recent Orlando hamcation in Florida and were encouraged to see so many friends at that show. Allnut spoke recently with Tim Duffy, K3LR, for his DX Engineering YouTube show. Rick, you know, one of the things I get asked about all the time is, what about the food vendors at Hamvention? Can you, can you talk about that, Rick? One of the things that was true about Hera as a place, God rest its soul, uh, was that the food wasn't all that good. And one of the things that uh, that the committee that helped to choose the fairgrounds as uh, the location and in negotiation with the, uh, the Greene County Fairgrounds is we insisted that the food that's going to be available is of a much higher quality. So, so we have really tasty food of a lot of different kinds, not just hamburgers and hot dogs. Many Hamvention tickets were sold at the pre-show price and are also available on the Hamvention website. Hamvention, an ARRL-sanctioned event, will be held May 20th through the 22nd at the Green County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. And, of course, ARRL Expo will be there. It's going to be wonderful, all not told DX Engineering's Tim Duffy. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The aisles at the Orlando Cam Nation were full of people, and the vendors appeared pleased with the brisk business, and the Hamvention booth was bombarded with well-wishers and folks with one question on their mind. Are you going to have Hamvention this year? All that said, it's been a pleasure to assure everyone that Hamvention 2022 is a go. All that noted that he and Michael Calter, WHCI, were interviewed during a DX Engineering YouTube video on February 22nd, and unveiled the official logo for Hamvention 2022. This year's theme of reunion celebrates the return to a world of hams getting together after missing two Hamventions, and commemorates the history of Dayton Hamvention, which stretches back 70 years to 1952. Ticket sales are very brisk, Calter said. The community is very excited about things. There have been improvements made at the Expo Center, and they're totally on our side working with us. They said both he and Allnut were at the Orlando Camcation, which he called very successful, and a good omen for Hamvention success in 2022. We don't consider it a competition among shows, Calter said. We're all working together to make amateur radio much better. Hamvention will also feature ARRL's Expo, a large assembly of ARRL-sponsored exhibits, activities, and representatives for ARRL programs and services. 
Several ARRL-sponsored presentations and forums will be given. Information will be posted to ARRL.org slash expo as it becomes available. Colter also highly recommended attending Contest University on May 19th at the Hope Hotel, which takes place on the Thursday before Hamvention as an adjunct to the Hamvention experience. The ARRL has filed comments with the United States Forest Service seeking an exemption for amateur radio facilities to a proposed new $1,400 annual administrative fee. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more details on this new proposed fee and comments proposed by the ARRL. The USFS proposal resulted from requirements in the Farm Bill of 2018, which directs the Forest Service to collect fees in order to recover costs to the agency, sort of like the yet-to-be-imposed FCC ham radio application fees. The $1,400 proposed fee is on top of fees such as rent already being paid. Existing fees generally have been in the $130 to $140 a year class for amateur uses. The comment filing window has been reopened and extended, so additional comments will be accepted through March 31st. If you missed the first comment period or have more to say, go for it. ARRL stressed that equipment, maintenance, and other costs associated with amateur radio facilities on U.S. Forest Service lands are, quote, borne solely by the volunteer radio amateurs themselves. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Although the discussion put forward by the Forest Service in its proposed focuses on commercial uses, the proposal would sweep within its requirements amateur radio uses that are solely non-commercial, ARRL said in its comments filed on February 22nd. Radio amateurs establish and maintain facilities at certain locations for public service purposes with no remuneration or reimbursement. Unlike broadcasters and commercial wireless and fiber providers, radio amateurs are uniquely barred by the terms of their federal licenses from receiving compensation of any sort. Non-commercial and uncompensated communication uses by radio amateurs within forest service areas long have served the public interest in many ways among them by providing the means for otherwise unobtainable emergency communication capabilities in times of need, the ARRL noted. Amateurs perform this valuable public service without cost to taxpayers. The importance of these capabilities has been demonstrated repeatedly. The skills of radio amateur operators have served our country well with their carefully located equipment when enabling exchanges of possibly life-saving messages in difficult terrain during forest fires, extending communications assistance help during hurricanes, and providing communication capabilities during search and rescue missions in remote areas. It is foreseeable that many radio amateurs providing these services would have to opt to withdraw and cease their work if not exempted from the proposed fees, the ARRL said. In many cases, the most useful locations for needed coverage from their stations is uniquely on Forest Service lands. In short, the proposal to include volunteer, uncompensated amateur service applicants with the commercial wireless service and broadcast applicants is grossly inequitable. There is a disparity in the amount of resources necessary to consider applications from radio amateurs as compared to that required by commercial applicants. Our best estimate is that there are fewer than 100 covered amateur locations, but those likely are unique and essential to covering forested areas in times of need, such as forest fires or lost hikers, the ARRL said. These dissimilarities in complexity and scope should be recognized in the fees proposal and amateur radio applicants exempted. As an example, Hams in Michigan who provide emergency communications have told local officials that because they rely on the use of tower located inside a national forest, they may now face a new fee of $1,400 to operate. As another example, according to a report in the Manistee News, the Manistee County Amateur Radio Operators Club received notice from the U.S. Forest Service 
that there might be a fee for their use of the tower. Forest Service officials announced in December that they have proposed such fees for any communications users, including cellular phone providers, maintaining permanent equipment on Forest Service land. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Because, of course, uh, since I've been here last, Russia has invaded Ukraine. And uh, we, had, we had seen some uh, DDoS attacks on the Ukrainian financial system prior. Russia has always used Ukraine as a testing ground for its cyber capabilities. The Ukraine grid was brought down some years ago for a few hours, and it was widely uh, believed by uh, U.S. intelligence and others that this was uh, Russia just, you know, testing stuff. Can we do it? Yeah, we can. Good to know. Just a little bit. And we're just waiting now to see what happens, especially as the latest news is that Russia isn't, it's not going as well as... <laughs> As everyone assumed, with Russia's 200,000 troops on the border, there's the uh, freedom fighters in Ukraine. Uh, well, maybe they have a little more to fight for. I guess I'll amend this, is that if I were going to target the United States, and I wouldn't, of course, I have no capabilities to do so, but if a nation state were to target the United States, they'd probably go after four different areas. Our financial system, highly computerized and somewhat vulnerable, I hate to say it, our electrical grid, even more vulnerable. Our food system, which is not great. And then there's a fourth kind of cyber warfare, which has been going on for some time already. They don't call it cyber war. They call it net war. And actually, this goes back to a uh, interestingly named Rand Corporation pamphlet published in 1993. It's probably the first time the word cyber war ever was used. The pamphlet was called Cyber War is Coming with an exclamation mark. 1993, the earliest days of the public Internet, you know. That's when people were just starting to get online. But I think the authors, we'll give them credit, John Arkea and uh, Don Ronfeld, or sorry, David Ronfeld, had some uh, inkling that the world was going to become more interconnected by the Internet. The premise of the pamphlet, the information revolution would alter the nature of armed conflict. They talked about cyber war, which is DDoS attacks and, you know, viruses and malware and ransomware. And that's certainly been, you know, part of our landscape for some years. It was estimated last year that 75% of all the ransomware attacks, all the ransomware attacks bringing down infrastructure like Colonial Pipeline, state and federal government agencies, were all 75% of them originated in Russia. And I, we don't know with or without the support and approval of uh, Putin, but I'm going to guess with. Not much happens in Russia that Putin doesn't get to say yay or nay on. So they talked about cyber war, the warfare we're familiar with, but they also have this term that has not caught on, but it maybe should call net war. We call it today disinformation. Conflicts waged via networked modes of communication. When one group attempts to disrupt the knowledge Another group has about its own members and social context. This was 1992 these guys wrote this. Or 93. Kind of prescient. They kind of, they must have had a crystal ball. When one group attempts to disrupt the knowledge another group has about its own members and social context by means of messages transmitted via networked communications technologies. That's net war. That's before Facebook, before Twitter. In 1993, I don't. We had. I don't even know if we we had ICQ. I don't even think we had AIM. You know, this was. But they were. They were right. They they imagined it as a state based activity. I mean, this is the earliest days of the internet. They already kind of saw this coming. I guess they said. You know, early examples of this would be Radio Free Europe or Radio Liberty or the Net War we engaged with in Cuba in the 60s and 70s via Radio Televisión Martí. Federal government funded Miami television broadcaster that transmitted in Spanish to Cuba, state run newspapers, news services. But now, you know, we have RT, Russia Today, which is a Russian government news service that is widely quoted in the U.S. We have troll farms in Russia that have been used to spread disinformation on the social networks. It's, it's essentially propaganda. 
in a much more powerful, potent, and dangerous form. So that's the fourth prong of the attack. And I think we may see all three. What concerns me a little bit, I hope it's just saber rattling, but this is from the uh, NBC News. President Biden has been presented with options for massive cyber attacks against Russia. Oh yeah, we have our we have our capabilities. NBC News reported four people familiar with deliberations, two US intelligence officials, one western intelligence official, and another person briefed on the matter say US intelligence and military cyber warriors are proposing the use of American cyber weapons on a scale never before contemplated among the options. Knocking out Russia's internet shutting off electric power, tampering with railroad switches. By the way, that's what Ru another thing Russia did. They did it in, uh, wait a minute, no, I'm sorry. We did, I think freelance hackers did that in uh, Belarus, right? They, they shut down the train system for a brief period of time. You could do everything from slow trains down, said one of the sources, to have them fall off the tracks. That makes me a little nervous. This is, you know, we're, we're kind of well aware of the consequences of nuclear war, and there is a certain amount of deterrence on both sides because if one uses nuclear weapons, then the other could. And, well, it doesn't take much imagination to see the end game there. We saw it back with the movie War Games, remember? The only way to win is not to play. We don't really have a good sense of what cyber warfare would look like or could look like. And it makes me nervous, assuming that, you know, look, Russia is not a big, big nation. They do have nuclear weapons, but they're really their economy is about the size of Texas. They're not a superpower. But they have, you know, any more than North Korea is really a superpower, but they have good hackers. It doesn't take much, really, to develop a core of talented hackers. China's got them. We've got them. I'm going to guess England and Germany and France have them, too. It's a lot easier to create a cyber nuclear capability than it is to create an actual nuclear capability. And I get very nervous the idea of us shutting down the Russian Internet, because I don't think that would happen without retaliation i got an email from somebody saying you know after this war we broke out we thought we better get a we better get a, a password manager what do you recommend <laughs> wow and i i recommend you know getting a password manager almost anyone would be better than nothing there's there are quite a few good ones out there google is saying they're going to respond to this war with stepping up security especially in russia there's been calls for apple to abandon Russia to shut down its app store to make the iPhone useless. No response from Apple, but it may be moot if uh, if sanctions go far enough. Apple may may stop working in Russia. The app store may be useless in Russia. I guess uh, I get you know I always have said well, well this is the toy store of uh, of subjects you know that's a fun stuff it's important it makes a difference it's changing the world but it's not you know nobody dies well that could be that that may not be the case anymore. I uh, call for cool heads, okay? Let cooler heads prevail. Let's not start something we will regret. Let's really think about it. And the good news is, so far, there has been no move, as far as I know, to carry out any cyber attacks. But I think it would be an act of war, wouldn't it? It's a cheap and easy thing to do. But the risk of escalation is the thing that makes me a little bit nervous. Man, the technology folks are just, uh, they're jumping in. Did you see the tweet from Mikhailo Fedorov, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine and Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, calling all hackers. The tweet reads, we are creating an IT army. We need digital talents. All operational tasks will be given here. And he gives out a telegraph, I'm sorry, telegram uh, address, t.me slash IT army of... I think he left out a, a letter. It says Ukraine. I think he meant Ukraine. There will be tasks for everyone who continue to fight on the cyber front. The first task is on the channel for cyber specialists. I, I hear that there are there is a lot of uh, signal messaging going on. That for sure. Really uh, fascinating situation there from a technology point of view. A great many of the technology companies you know and use and perhaps love either started in Ukraine or have programmers in Ukraine. As with most of the Eastern Bloc, there are a lot of very talented computer folk. Ukraine was where Grammarly was started. 
and and uh, you know the headquarters I think is in the U.S. now, but uh, the programming team's still in Ukraine. I use a photo editor, I love it, called Luminar. That's from a company called Skylum in Ukraine. In fact, if you go to their website, they have a uh, a banner up at the top there with the Ukraine colors, the uh, blue and gold or gold and blue. And uh, it says, save Ukraine, defend democracy. Wow. Skylum was proudly founded in Ukraine. Our core development center is based in Kiev. At this harrowing time, ultim- unfortunately, we cannot guarantee on-time delivery of updates to Luminar Nero. Neo, d- dudes, relax. It's okay. Don't worry about the software. It's okay. We understand. Nobody's going to be pounding on your door saying, where's that update? No. You take care of yourselves. It's really interesting to uh, to watch. I mean, of course, you know, there's huge impact in, in, in lives. However... Just from the pure tech point of view, it's really interesting to see tech get involved. I think something like $17 million in uh, Bitcoin has been donated. It's interesting. Russia might actually have to turn to Bitcoin because uh, their financial system is being blocked by sanctions. And uh, so this is one thing Bitcoin's good for, isn't it? It's uh, bypassing the traditional financial system, the SWIFT system, the banking system. And just kind of person-to-person transfer. I don't think you can probably get a lot done that way. I don't know. Yesterday, the BBC reported millions in Bitcoin pouring into Ukraine. More than 4,000 donations. One donor giving 3 million in Bitcoin to an NGO. The official Twitter account of the Ukraine government yesterday posted a tweet. Stand with the people of Ukraine now accepting cryptocurrency donations. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and USDT. It's fascinating uh, how technology changes everything, even war. Now, we've talked before on the show about cyber warfare and the risks to us here in the U.S. and, of course, the risks to people in uh, Ukraine and even in Russia. I expect a lot of uh, cyber warfare to kind of crop up here and there. Ransomware. Hackers shut down a couple of weeks ago, shut down the Belarus railway system for some hours hoping to slow the transport of Russian tanks and troops to the front line. I hate saying that word. On the other hand, Patreon has shut down Ukrainian non-governmental organization, NGO, called Come Back Alive. They've been raising money for Ukrainian forces in conflict zones for eight years now. Patreon just noticed and shut them down, saying we don't allow Patreon to be used for funding weapons or military activity. I guess that's not unreasonable. But nowadays with crypto, you can just donate directly, right? In fact, the Ukraine uh, government posted, you know, their Bitcoin wallet. All of the, you know, the humanity aside, I want to say that first and foremost. That's really what matters is uh, the loss of life, uh, the, the tragedy that's unfolding. It's also a little inspiring, I have to say. I'm a little inspired by the, the strength of the Ukraine people and standing up to this invasion. But all that aside, I think uh, also very interesting how technology uh, has changed all of this. It used to be the uh, the first thing you do is you, uh, if you're invading a country, you go and you shut down the newspaper and the radio stations, right? Now, what it would I guess you'd shut down the internet first. First of all, they weren't, they have not been able to do that. They have not been able to do that. Japanese billionaire Hiroshi Mikitani donated a billion yen. To Ukraine, that's about 8.7 million. I don't know if he did it through Bitcoin. I mean, how, I guess, uh, are the banks still operating? I guess. It kind of makes all of the uh, video game warfare that m- people you and I have engaged in over the last decade or so kind of seem childish, I guess. Of course, you know, the first thing you do is you shut down the radio and the newspapers or you shut down the internet. The funny thing is, Funny, not haha, but an interesting thing is Russia has had to shut down Twitter in Russia. They don't want to hear any protests and they can't control it. And so they just turned it off. Facebook, too. Facebook, too. Maybe that tells you something about the value of social media. We always talk about the negatives, the disinformation. The Russians have used Facebook and Twitter against us with disinformation campaigns. Yeah, but it goes both ways, doesn't it? It goes both ways. Facebook confirmed that Russia's media regulator, Roskomnadzor, said it would partly restrict Facebook because Facebook refuses to 
fact check or stop fact checking Russian state media. Now, remember, these autocratic regimes, China, Russia, have insisted, A, that companies like Twitter, Facebook and Google have offices, local offices in country. That's so there's someone to arrest, someone to put in jail, someone to punish. Otherwise, they're overseas companies. And of course, they've also demanded, well, you have to keep data in the country. We must have all data from all users. American companies like Microsoft have so far resisted that. In fact, it's one reason Facebook's being threatened in Europe. Facebook says, no, no, we want to keep it in, uh, in the U.S., and uh, the agreements, the Schrems agreements that were made with the European regulators, the regulators are now saying, no, you, we, this isn't working. Facebook's saying, fine, if that's how you feel, we'll leave Europe. Uh, I don't know if that's the, how long that's going to stay. Anyway, we, uh, we don't have to talk about uh, all of that. This, I, I like to think of this show as a little escape from the, the day-to-day news of the world. So, you know, but it is, it's interesting. It's time to talk space. With Spaceman Rod Pyle. Uh, now some not good so news. good news. Yeah. Uh, of course, this war that uh, Putin has inflicted on the Ukraine. Tragedy for everybody. But it does make one wonder, uh, you know, Russia is very heavily involved in the International Space Station, aren't they? Yeah, and, and other efforts. And uh, we've already had, I mean, we saw after, after the annexation of Ukraine in 2014... We saw operations proceeding pretty well. You know, the mission controls were still talking to each other here and in Russia, and the crews were getting along well on the space station. But on the ground, of course, we were, you know, spitting at each other and uh, not having a good time of it. This is, of course, much bigger. And again, you know, we're talking about the space flight angle. I mean, this is not at all to diminish the deprivations and suffering that are going on in Ukraine. It's awful. But it's something that's being talked about uh, at NASA and elsewhere because it's a big problem. So when the Soviet Union fell in 1991, we made overtures. We had been planning a space station with European partners in Japan. We said, hey, Russia, you've got these components that you've been building for your replacement for Mir, their earlier space station. Why don't you come join the party? And they said, okay. So they control the power unit. And they do the propulsion uh, burns that, that reorient the thing into the proper orbit and keep it there. And they have another a number of other orbits and docking ports and an airlock and so forth. Other modules, excuse me, and docking ports and so forth. And so their hardware is all over the station. And they control it. And that's a piece of their national territory as our half is Oh, our it's not territory. international territory. It's, it's yeah. Russia. Yeah, it's Russia. Oh, interesting. So if they that. decide to uncouple and go away, that's a real problem, potentially the end of the station. Or if they decide to do some kind of scorched earth, okay, we're, you know, and this is unlikely, I think. But if they did decide, okay, we're cutting the cables and, you know, taking a hammer to the interior of this thing because we're angry at you, that would be bad. And that would be an early end of the space station. That could happen as early as, I suppose it could happen immediately, but the agreement on their end isn't solid past 2025 so while we're we're talking about keeping up till 2030 they've uh, been dragging their feet a bit on on uh, verifying their participation so you know that's questionable but there's other stuff too uh we, we already know that that china and russia have been talking about building their own moon base as sort of a pushback on the u.s artemis program with our european and asian partners so there's there's that split already but these sanctions also as as you've, I think, been talking about are going to really impact their technological imports, that cripples an already challenged space program. Their budget's gotten smaller and smaller over the last few years. We depend on them for cargo deliveries. We, as I said, depend on them for their progress modules to go up and reposition the the ISS to keep it in proper orbit. So while SpaceX could pick up that slack, I think, in pretty short order, it would represent a major change. We're now, also, NASA says it's going to be business as usual. Yeah, well, they have to, right? Right. I mean, we're not, I mean, we're not going to issue, issue sanctions against the space station. No, but we're sanctioning their, a lot of their technology imports, yeah. and that's hardware they that may they retaliate. to build their space. Yeah. Well, and, and those go into their spacecraft. There's yeah. a lot of that stuff that they don't make because they don't have to. They've uh, just recently pulled their people out of French Guiana, which is where European Space Agency and France have their... A launch facility and Soyuz had a launch facility there so they're pulling away from that and you know in in kind of smaller bits 
There's Russian and Ukrainian component in uh, some of the products built by Northrop Grumman and other contractors here, including rocket engines. Although, as I understand it, most of that inventory is already on U.S. soil, but there's still bits that we want. So, you know, there's a lot lot going on here, a lot of moving parts, and we're going to have to see what happens this trade space. There there has been a little sword rattling. Dmitry Rogozin, who's the director of Roscosmos... And I and I was hoping you'd read these quotes because you do have so much better. He says, do you want to destroy our cooperation on the ISS? He tweeted yes. Yes. It, in Russian, but this is my best Russian. If you block cooperation with us, who will save the ISS from uncontrolled deorbiting and falling into the United States or Europe? There is also option of dropping a 50, 500 ton structure to India and China. So there's a lot of, you know, it's very, Putin also threatened the use of atomic weapons. There's a lot of saber rattling coming out of Russia right now, which does not endear them to me or probably anybody in the West. I don't think they're endearing themselves to anybody right yeah. now, except possibly the Russian population. Rizigan also went on to say to blame, quote, talented U.S. businessmen for all the space debris. Oh, please. Which is, this is coming from the guys who just they blew, blew up, up a satellite, yeah. right? Is he, he's obviously Putin's he's, man. Well, he's the head of their their space program, so he's really not somebody you can, but this is the same guy that said, you know, what, you're, you're not going to use our Soyuz capsules? You're going to buy some trampolines to get to your space station? Oh, so, you know, he's he's been a big mouth and a hot These guys are basically time. mobsters. It would Did be a you? shame if anything were to happen to China or <laughs> to India. To your space if station. anything were to happen, yeah. it would be shame. Well, you know, they can always go back to using vacuum tubes on their spacecraft. Uh, they were kind of the last people to do that. Did well, you uh, already talk about uh, Elon and the, and the Starlink? In, in this case, I guess what gives me some hope is that, he, you know, he's talking about shipping them Starlink base stations, which... You know, he's got them, right? So it's just getting them into Ukraine. I guess the question is, and what I don't know, I was actually uh, texting Tariq to see if he knew, to find out if he has to actually retask any of these satellites, uh, the Starlink satellites, into new orbits to give Ukraine more coverage, or if they're already sufficiently dense there for that to occur. But, I mean, anything's anything's helpful when you've had your So he says right? we're sending more terminals. That's the base station, the terminals? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's the little... Uh, rectilinear uh, re- rectenna, I think they call it. So okay. Kind of the, the dish. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, I, I, if Russia were really yeah. determined to knock out the uh, internet in Ukraine, I think that would be a pretty soft target for them. So. I think so, but you can't knock out satellites, right? I mean, they could try. Yeah, but the be, terminals you can easily knock out. You can. And what's interesting, you know, both China and Russia have been testing abilities to laser dazzle and take down satellites oh wow Uh, but elon has so many of them and they're moving so quickly in these low orbits that they'd be really hard to get at it's easy to target a geosynchronous satellite because it's just sitting in one spot right but when you got things whizzing overhead every 90 minutes you'd have to target a lot of satellites so he could end up you know playing a heavy role in national security if if he was uh, taken into that all right rod have a good one thank you take care very good to see you nice to see you as always Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Picture the following scenario in a slightly grainy black and white for added effect. It's the 1950s. A ham is sitting at his station, having a CW CUSO. He's wearing a suit and tie. Before him is a Hammerlin receiver, a Johnson Viking transmitter, and a homebrew modulator. On the wall are QSL cards and his honorable discharge certificate. On the table is a collection of QST magazines along with some curious pamphlets with titles such as Protect Them, Join Civil Defense, Take Your Place in Civil Defense, It Can Happen Here, Know the Signals, and even a comic book featuring a character called Bert the Turtle. While the Vibroplex clicks away, 
another radio sits in the background, quietly spitting out atmospheric noise. It's an AM broadcast receiver, one of those five-tube ACDC models produced by the millions. This unit, an Arvin in an Art Deco plastic cabinet, is tuned to one of two triangular markings on the dial. Suddenly the silence is shattered by a piercing 1,000 cycle tone. The ham looks up, rips off his headphones, and listens to a message. Colonel Rad Channel, this is a Class 1 emergency. All civilian traffic is barred from streets and highways. Stay in your homes. Stay in your homes. He jumps from the chair, runs to the door, and yells to his wife, Grab the kids and go down to the fallout shelter. The Connell Rad alarm just went off. Know what Connell Rad means? It stands for Control of Electromagnetic Radiation. Sounds pretty complicated if you're not an electronic engineer. And yet all you have to do is dial your AM radio to 640 or 1240 in the event of an enemy air attack. And thanks to Connell Rad, you will continue to receive official information. Remember, in times of civil defense emergency, for official news and civil defense instructions, Dial Conalrad at 640 or 1240 on your AM standard radio. Conalrad, which stood for Control of Electromagnetic Radiations, had its embryonic start in December 1951 when President Harry Truman signed an executive order directing the FCC to set up a security system for all civilian radio services. Throughout 1952, Conalrad was developed and tested and by early 1953 it was ready. The purpose of Connell Rad was to relay civil defense information to the public without allowing enemy aircraft to use our radio signals as a beacon for their direction finding equipment. This is Dennis James. Here is a message about Connell Rad from Leo A. Hoig, Director of the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization. Radio beams can help guide enemy planes or missiles to their target. Yet during a war, information would be urgently needed by the public. This is the reason for Conrad. When Conrad goes into effect, all radio and television stations will sign off the air. In a few minutes, the Conrad radio stations will return to the air over either 640 or 1240. In case of attack, all other stations will be off the air. You will not be able to get information over your telephone. Only Conrad at these frequencies, 640 or 1240, on your radio will give you official information and instructions. In the event of an emergency, all FM, TV, and most AM stations would proceed with the following alarm sequence. First, current programming would be discontinued. Then, five seconds, the carrier was off the air. Followed by, five seconds, an unmodulated carrier. Then, five seconds, carrier off the air. Followed by 15 seconds of a 1,000 cycle modulated carrier. Then, a one minute maximum initial Conrad message. And finally, the carrier off the air for the duration of the alert. The remaining AM stations would shift to either 640 or 1240 kilocycles and simultaneously broadcast a more detailed emergency message. The stations would constantly turn their carriers on and off. For example, Station A, operating on 640 kilocycles, would broadcast the emergency message for 15 seconds and suddenly cut its carrier. The public would then hear Station B, also on 640 kilocycles with the same message. When station B went silent, station C would appear and, after a few seconds, station A would be back on the air. This cluster pattern would continue until the emergency message had been broadcast. The same activity would be happening on 1240 kilocycles. No call signs or other ID would be given. In this way, the FCC and the Office of Civil Defense hope to confuse enemy aircraft trying to use AM radio stations as a homing beacon. The ARRL and the FCC realized that amateur stations might also serve as a beacon. Therefore, from the beginning, amateurs were urged to keep watch on 640 or 1240 kilocycles and to kill their transmitters when the alarm was given. With the importance of Conrad in the early 1950s, it's surprising that amateurs were not required to monitor for the Conrad alarm. 
This was rectified on January 2nd, 1957, when the FCC amended Part 12 of the Rules and Regulations to require the following. All operators of stations in the amateur radio service will be responsible for the reception of the Conelrad radio alert by monitoring 640 or 1240 kilocycles. During a Conelrad radio alert, all operators of amateur radio stations will cease communications immediately. Stations operating under the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, RACES, and other stations specifically authorized would be allowed to remain on the air under the following conditions. No transmission would be made unless it is of extreme emergency affecting the national safety or the safety of life and property. Transmissions would be as short as possible. No station identification or location would be given. Tactical calls would be utilized if necessary and the radio station carrier would be discontinued during periods of no message transmission. Amateur stations were not allowed back on the air until the Conelrad radio all clear message was transmitted. With the requirement of continuous broadcast band monitoring, homebrew projects, kits, and commercial products began to appear to help the amateur keep in compliance with Part 12-190. While some amateurs simply used a simple AM radio, Others bought or built specific Conelrad receivers. Heathkit had the CA-1 Conelrad alarm. Morrow Radio had the CM-1 Conelrad monitor. And the Walter Ash Radio Company had the model CA Conel alarm. Radio Shack's first transistor radio, which sold for a mere $29.95 and $1958, was advertised as perfect for monitoring Conelrad. When Class D CB radio was authorized in September of 1958, the rules specified that CBers also had to monitor Conelrad. In the event of an emergency, all citizen band operators had to leave the air. There were no races provisions for them. By the early 1960s, the possibility of long-range enemy bombers homing in on our radio signals was becoming remote. Instead, intercontinental ballistic missiles were the new threat. They didn't require our broadcast signals as beacons. Conelrad was becoming obsolete. Thus, in the autumn of 1962, Conelrad was replaced by the emergency broadcast system. Ironically, Conelrad disappeared right around the time it might have been needed the most, the Cuban Missile Crisis. As the 1960s wore on, the Cold War gradually disappeared and the specter of imminent enemy attack disappeared. Today, only the faded fallout shelter signs and those triangular markings on old AM radios remain to remind us of Conelrad and the Cold War. As I write this, I can hear a Springfield, Massachusetts station on 640 kilohertz, while a heterodyne of Class 4 stations co-mingles on 1240. And yet, what is that I hear faintly in the background? A 1000 cycle tone? This is Bill Continelli. W2XOY for this week in amateur radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio The other day I took delivery of a shiny new circuit board populated with components and connectors. Knowing me, you'd assume that I'd been the recipient of some kind of software defined radio gadget, and you'd be right. One of the connectors was a micro USB socket intended to be used to plug the hardware into a computer and to drive the circuit board. The board came to me by way of a friend who saw it online, waxed lyrical about it and for less than $35, who could begrudge this exploration into a new toy? Once it arrived, it sat on my shelf for a few weeks, enticingly packed in an anti-static bag, transparent enough to see the device inside, taunting me to open it up, plug it in and have some fun. Today, I opened it up and started researching my new gadget. It didn't come with any user manual, no URL, no model number, but it did have a call sign on it, so I started there. I'll note that I'm not going to repeat that call sign here, for a number of reasons, which I'll get into. My exploration discovered a site where this device was being sold. It also unearthed several international amateur radio forums, describing what appeared to be this device, including circuit diagrams and specifications. What I found harder to discover was software. It appears that I have a clone of a device that may still be manufactured, or not, I cannot tell. 
I found some example code on GitHub for the original hardware, but it seemed to require other libraries, but didn't actually specify those anywhere. I opened up an online translation tool and started translating some of the wording on the circuit board in an attempt to discover just what information was written on the board. The wording was clearly from a different culture, a different perspective, and while it claims to come from a makerspace that appears to promote women, it also contained a militaristic phrase which caused me to pause. In that moment I came to a sudden and abrupt realisation. How do I know what this piece of hardware actually does? How do I know if when I plug it into the first available USB socket on my computer, it won't install anything nefarious, start connecting to the internet, and start doing something unexpected? There's enough hardware on the circuit board to do that, and even if the labels on the components tell me that they are a specific integrated circuit, how do I know that it is actually that chip? The chips on this circuit appear to have a lot more connectivity than a simple receiver might warrant. One has 40 pins, the other 32. If the label is accurate, the data sheet for one of the chips indicates that it includes an 8-bit microcontroller among its various functions. I'll admit that I'm coming from an IT security background at this, and you're free to argue that I'm being paranoid, but does that make me wrong? I know that I don't know enough about this particular board or its origins that for now it's going to remain inside its anti-static bag, taunting me with the possibilities of the connectors it offers. But until I know more about the provenance of this gadget, it's going nowhere near any of my computers. If you have suggestions on how to proceed, don't be shy. I did briefly consider plugging it into a Pi, but how would I know if it updated the firmware, forever compromising that Pi? Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this board does any of this. My point is around discovering if it does or not, one way or another. No doubt, some might think I'm overly suspicious, and there's truth in that but in my profession it pays to be vigilant. The underlying issue is that of validation. There's antivirus software available to deal with malicious code, but how do you do such a thing for malicious hardware? Again, I'm not saying that this circuit board is doing anything other than being a USB connected receiver, but how would you know? How would you verify that? And how do we in the amateur community weed out the nefarious tools from the legitimate ones? I'll leave you with one thought. When was the last time you plugged your phone into a free charger on the bus or at the airport? How do you know that your phone wasn't hacked? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Some announcements. CPAC 2022 online registration has been delayed due to technical difficulties restarting the registration web pages. CPAC anticipates that online registration will open on March 7th. CPAC 2022 will host the ARRL Northwestern Division Convention June 3rd through the 5th. www.cpac.org. Bouvet Island 3Y0J de-expedition co-leader Ken Opscar LA7GIA has updated plans for the January 2023 de-expedition, noting that the camp setup plan will be finalized over the next three months. The plan is to get a small head start once they arrive. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports... Solar activity was weaker over the February 24th to March 2nd reporting week, with the average daily sunspot number dipping from 54 to 44, but average daily solar flux rising slightly from 95 to 98. Solar flux is predicted to be in the 100 plus range for the next week or so. Enjoy. Something significant has just happened on the sun. Solar physicist Scott McIntosh and Bob Lehman call it the termination event. McIntosh said that the old solar cycle 24 has finally died, and now the new solar cycle, solar cycle 25, can really take off. The termination event is a new idea in solar physics, outlined by McIntosh and Lehman in a December 2020 paper in the journal Solar Physics. Not everyone accepts it yet. But if Solar Cycle 25 unfolds as Macintosh and Lehman predict, the termination event will have to be taken seriously. The basic idea is this. Solar Cycle 25 started in December 2019. However, old Solar Cycle 24 refused to go away. It hung on for two more years, producing occasional old cycle sunspots and clogging the sun's upper layers with its decaying magnetic field. 
During this time, the two cycles coexisted. Cycle 25 struggled to break free, whilst old Solar Cycle 24 held it back. Cycle 24 was cramping Cycle 25's style, said Lehman. Researchers have long known that solar cycles can overlap. The twist, added by Macintosh and Lehman, is the realization that overlapping cycles interact. This makes sense. In the early 20th century, George Ellery Hale discovered that the magnetic polarity of sunspot pairs reverses itself from one cycle to the next. Indeed, the sun's entire global magnetic field flips roughly every 11 years. When adjacent, opposite polarity solar cycles overlap, they naturally interfere. Bands of opposite polarity magnetic activity ripple from the poles to the equator of the Sun, and when they meet, they cancel or terminate. Termination events mark the end of the interference between outgoing and incoming solar cycles, when the new cycle can break free of the old. Critically, the scientists suggest that the timing of the termination event can predict the intensity of the new cycle. In their solar physics paper, Macintosh and Lehman looked back over 270 years of sunspot data and found that termination events happen every 10 to 15 years. Lehman said that they found that the longer the time between terminators, the weaker the next cycle would be. Conversely, the shorter the time between terminators, the stronger the next solar cycle would be. So, when did the latest termination event happen? Well, it seems it was December 2021. This yields a specific, testable prediction for Solar Cycle 25. Macintosh said that they had finalised their forecast of Solar Cycle 25 amplitude. It will be just above the historical average, with a monthly smooth sunspot number of 190 plus or minus 20. Above average may not sound all that exciting, but this is in fact a sharp departure from the NOAA's official forecast of a weak solar cycle 25. It could be just enough to catapult the concept of termination events into the forefront of solar cycle prediction techniques. The progress of solar cycle 25 could prove the theory that there is a link between the termination event and the timing and strength of the following solar cycle. You can read more at spaceweather.com. Time now for the AMSAT report. Another amateur satellite has received its Oscar designation, SenoSat-1, which was developed by Orion Space, AMSAT Nepal and AMSAT Spain, has a radiation center payload and a store and forward transponder. It's now known as Nepal Oscar-116 or NO-116. If you need Saba and St. Eustatius, PJ-5, on satellite, Frank K3TRM will be operating as PJ-5 stroke K3TRM from March 6th to the 12th. Take this opportunity to grab the island for a new DXCC or VUCC entity in your log. Launched in August 1996, FO-29 continues to operate well if you've ever worked RS-44. FO-29 is just as easy. If you're learning how to operate the linear satellites, give FO-29 a shot. The satellite does have battery issues and is only active as long as the control operators feel the battery won't degrade too far. At that point, it's turned off. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel this week announced plans for the agency to launch a proceeding in April that would explore rules regarding radio receivers, not just transmitters, as is currently done, to ensure modern spectrum schemes are effective, as opposed to the ongoing C-band debate regarding aviation and 5G deployments. In the past, our discussions of spectrum efficiency have been a one-way effort. They have focused almost exclusively on transmitters, Ross and Wurzel said in a prepared remark delivered during a keynote at MWC 2022 in Barcelona that were released by the FCC. But here's the thing, wireless communications only exist when transmitters are connected to receivers. Both are vital, both matter, and going forward, policymakers need to consider both transmitting and receiving, not just the former at the expense of the latter. Next month, I will propose to my colleagues at the FCC that we launch a new inquiry to explore receiver performance and standards. 
Rosenworcel emphasized the potential for communications to move light years beyond the smartphone via connected sensor technology and associated computing processing advancement. But such innovation depends upon access to spectrum, which is increasingly more difficult to find, she said. We face a hard truth, Rosenworcel said. Greenfield spectrum, open and cleared for use, will not be as simple or easy to find. We will have to invest in new technologies to promote efficiency and use a range of spectrum policy tools, including shared access, priority and preemption, lightweight leasing, and dynamic database coordination to ensure access to our airwaves. All of these approaches can work, but some spectrum efficiency efforts have been undermined by existing devices that have receivers with little or no filtering, so they hear signals outside of their prescribed frequencies of operation. These signal conflicts degrade the effectiveness of the existing device even though the problematic transmission is not traditional interference because the transmission does not impede on the existing devices prescribed operational airwaves. Attention to this issue has been highlighted recently with 5G deployments on C-band spectrum. Wireless carriers like Verizon and AT&T paid a total of $81 billion during an FCC auction to purchase the C-band licenses and initially planned to deploy 5G on the airwaves in December. But the FAA expressed concerns that the 5G deployments would result in erroneous altimeter readings that could result in airplanes crashing, and the carriers altered their 5G rollouts in an effort to mitigate safety fears for most commercial flights. During a recent House subcommittee hearing, lawmakers focused primarily on the lack of coordination between the FAA, NTIA, and the FCC. However, the issue causing the problem is that some older airplane altimeters have receivers that lack filtering, meaning they can hear signals well outside the 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz band where altimeter transmissions operate, according to testimony from Robertson and Associates CEO Dennis Robertson. During his testimony, Robertson noted that the question whether the FCC should have rules governing receivers has been debated for 40 years, but the agency has limited its regulations to transmission issues to date. Rosenworcel did not cite the aviation safety issue specifically, but FCC Commissioner Nathan Symington did in his prepared statement welcoming Rosenworcel's announcement of an upcoming receiver proceeding. I applaud Chairman Rosenworcel's decision to consider exploring a new regulatory framework for commercial spectrum allocations, Symington said. An approach that looks at both the receiver and the transmitter ends of the equation is the only framework truly capable of timely accommodating the interest of federal users of spectrum and other incumbents. We see a lot of value in getting to a place where conflicts such as the C-band altimeter fight are headed off at the pass. This model will provide all interested parties sufficient advance warning about problematic band edges adjacent to any new commercial spectrum. Clear rights regarding interference protection can provide incentives for innovation and collaboration among Spectrum users in a way that avoids regulatory dictate. Rosenworcel also outlined some of the key concepts that she expects to include in the NOI next month. This inquiry would ask how receiver improvements could provide greater opportunities for access to Spectrum, Rosenworcel said. It would explore how these specifications could come in the form of incentives, guidelines or regulatory requirements in specific frequency bands or across all bands. And it would see comment on legal authority and market-based mechanisms that could help create a more transparent and predictable radio frequency environment for all spectrum users, both new and old. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station is now accepting applications until March 31st from U.S. schools, museums, science centers, and community youth organizations working individually or together interested in hosting contacts with International Space Station crew members. Contacts will be scheduled between January 1st and June 30th, 2023. Proposal information and additional details are available on the Aris USA website. 
Eris is looking for organizations capable of attracting large numbers of participants and integrating the contact into a well-developed education plan. Eris contacts afford participants the opportunity to learn firsthand from astronauts what it's like to live and work in space. The program's goal is to inspire students to pursue interests and careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Students can learn about satellite communications, wireless technology, scientific research on the ISS, radio science, and related topics. They'll also learn how to use amateur radio to talk directly to an ISS crew member. Contacts are approximately 10 minutes long. ARIS will help educational organizations to locate amateur radio groups that can assist contact hosts with equipment and operational support. Because of the nature of human spaceflight and the complexity of scheduling activities aboard the ISS, host schools and organizations must demonstrate flexibility to accommodate changes in dates and times. An ARIS introductory webinar will be held on March 4th at 0100 UTC, the evening of March 3rd in North American time zones. Registration is required. Direct questions to ARIS USA. Registration is now open for the 21st USA Championships of Amateur Radio Direction Finding, or ARDF, and is set for April 7th through the 10th, 2022. The competition will take place in Prince William Forest Park near Quantico, Virginia. Radio orienteers from all over the country, plus visitors from abroad, are invited to attend, said ARRL ARDF co-coordinator Gerald Boyd. WB8, WFK. The competitive courses are open to anyone of any age with or without an amateur radio license. The results will help select who will be invited to fill positions on ARDF Team USA, which will travel to Serbia for the 2022 ARDF World Championships in September. Wednesday, April 6th, will be a practice day for equipment testing and a competitor briefing. From Thursday through Sunday, competitors will have the opportunity to compete in the sprint, fox ring, and classic courses on 2 meters and 80 meters. Awards for first through third places will be presented at ceremonies following the events. Members of the Backwoods Orienting Club will organize the 2022 USA Championships. All are experienced radio orienteers who organized the successful 2013 and 2019 National Championships. The event director is Joseph Huberman, K5JGH, and the registrar is Ruth Bromer, WB4QZG. The International Amateur Radio Union sets ARDF championship rules. For scoring and awards, participants are divided in 12 age and gender categories. In the classic ARDF events, competitors start together in small groups made up of different categories. As they seek the Fox transmitters, they navigate through the forest from the starting corridor to the finish line, a distance ranging between 4 and 12 kilometers, about 2.5 miles and 7.4 miles. They plot their direction-finding bearings on orienteering maps that show terrain features, elevation contours, and vegetation type. The USA ARDF championships are open to anyone who can safely navigate the woods by themselves. A ham radio license is not required, Boyd emphasized. In ARDF, personal navigation skills are important because each participant competes as an individual. Any teamwork or GPS map use is forbidden. Competitors bring their own direction-finding gear to the events, although extra gear is often available for loan from other attendees. Competitors may not transmit on the course, except in emergencies. Information bulletin number two contains the complete schedule, technical details, fees, rule variations, and more. An email reflector is available for Q&A with the organizers as well as for coordinating transportation and arranging equipment loans. Announcement, rules, organizer instructions, and more are available at the ARRL ARDF website. Basic information on international style transmitter hunting is on the Homing In website, which includes equipment ideas for 2 meters and 80 meters, plus photos and stories from previous championships. ARRL Life member Courtney Duncan, N5BF, will be the keynote speaker for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo on Saturday, March 12th in the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo Auditorium. 
with more details on what the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo has to offer, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this special report. The semi-annual virtual ham radio gathering will be live March 12th and 13th. Tickets are now on sale at www.qsotodayhamexpo, all one word, dot com. Duncan will discuss the importance of amateur radio and technical hobbies in advancing global technology. This edition of the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will showcase a wide range of topics with appeal to newcomers and veterans alike. It's a chance to update your amateur radio knowledge and get exposed to cutting edge ham radio technology as well as do practical operating and building techniques. Like a live ham radio convention or ham fest, the Expo has presentations, exhibits, and state-of-the-art lounges for face-to-face -face interaction among participants. Some 60 ham radio luminaries will address a multitude of topics during the virtual event, from de-expeditions to Solar Cycle 25. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Just retired from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Courtney Duncan, N5BF, supported numerous missions involving digital and radio frequency hardware and software, most recently as telecommunications lead for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. Some highlights of the upcoming Ham Expo seminars will include Mike Crownover, AB5EB, Erwin Marion, LB1QI, and Bill Straw, KO7SS, will discuss their plans to operate from Bouvet Island in November 2022. ARRL Central Division Director and ARRL Electromagnetic Compatibility Committee Chair, Carl Lutzelschwab, K9LA, will present an update on Solar Cycle 25. Chasing DX during a contest is the subject of a presentation by Bill Salyers, AJHB. He'll offer best practices, tools, and techniques to increase your chances of logging DX during operating events. Because it's a virtual event, you don't have to pick and choose which presentations you can attend. You can watch any one of them within 30 days of the Expo, as well as explore exhibitor offerings from the comfort of your computer or other device. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. Tickets include entry for the live two-day event and the 30-day on-demand period. Spain's International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, URE, reports that extensive work is underway to make EURSAT-1 available before the end of the year. If all goes according to plan, EURSAT-1 will launch aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral in October 2022. URE says EURSAT-1 is based upon architecture used from the AMSAT EA Genesis, EASAT-2, and Hades missions, but with significant improvements such as a 32-bit computer and enhancements in the deployment mechanism, antennas, and batteries. EURSAT-1 will carry a VHF, UHF, FM ham radio repeater, as well as digipating capability of AX.25 and APRS. The URE says the payload is not yet defined, but could be the same slow-scan television camera that flies in Hades, a thruster, or some kind of experiment. One confirmed report is a chess game that will allow radio amateurs to play against the onboard computer via FSK telemetry. Several radio amateurs are working on the project, and if it's completed by the time the satellite is due to be delivered, it will be included. URE has created a blog in Spanish where the status of the project is being reported. The Bouvet Island 3YOJ de-expedition co-leader Ken Opsker LA7GIA has updated plans for the January 2023 de expedition, noting that the camp setup plan will be finalized over the next three months. The plan is to go ashore upon arrival, even during a very short weather window, starting with a single generator, antennas, and five radios and tent, plus necessary food, water, heat, and safety gear. The subsequent runs ashore will bring another generator, more antennas, fuel, radios, and spare parts. 
we have roughly five metric tons of equipment and food, water, and fuel supplies to be landed, but for us to be able to go ashore and make QSOs, only a small fraction of that must be landed, he said on the team's Facebook page. If we have a longer weather window, we will of course continue to land all equipment in one long run. The ARL Board of Directors held their regularly scheduled meeting at the end of January. And here with all the results is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. The ARRL Board of Directors met in Windsor, Connecticut, January 21st and 22nd, and re-elected President Rick Roderick, K5UR, for a fourth term. He's been in office since 2016. One new face will be among the officers at the next ARRL Board of Directors meeting in July. The board elected John Sager, WJ7S of Utah, to succeed Treasurer Rick Niswander, K7GM, on May 1st. Niswander had previously shared his decision to step down, having completed more than 10 years of distinguished service in the volunteer position. His most recent two-year term as treasurer expired in January. The board re-elected him to continue to serve through April 30th, allowing a transition between Niswander and treasurer-elect Sager. These remaining officers were re-elected. First Vice President Mike Raisbeck, K1TWF. Second Vice President Bob Valio, W6RGG. International Affairs Vice President Rod Stafford, W6ROD. Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA. And Chief Financial Officer Diane Middleton, W2DLM. Two new members will fill openings on the ARRL Board of Directors Executive Committee, which acts in the board's stead between scheduled board meetings elected as new EC members, were Dakota Division Director Bill Lippert, AC0W, and Pacific Division Director Kristen McIntyre, K6WX. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Executive Committee consists of the President, five directors selected by the Board of Directors for one-year terms, the first Vice President and the Chief Executive Officer. With all positions now filled, the Executive Committee members are President Rick Roderick, K5UR, who chairs the EC, first Vice President Michael N. Raisback, K1TWF, Atlantic Division Director Tom Abernethy, W3TOM, Dakota Division, Bill Lippert, A-C-O-W. Pacific Division Director, Kirsten McIntyre, K-6-W-X. West Division Director, John Robert Stratton, N-5-A-U-S. Great Lakes Division Director, Dale Williams, W-A-8-E-F-K. Chief Executive Officer, David Minster, N-A-2-A-A. -A. Minutes from the meeting have been posted on PDF format at the ARRL website. The radio amateur who co-developed the Ethernet at the Pointing Xerox Park Research Center, David Boggs, WA3DBJ, has died at 71, the New York Times has reported. He was best known for co-inventing the Ethernet PC connection standard, used to link PCs in close proximity to other computers, printers, and Internet over both wired and wireless connections. The Xerox Park Research Lab in Palo Alto developed much of the PC tech we take for granted today, like the graphic user interface, mouse, and word processor. Boggs joined the team in 1973 and started working with fellow researcher Bob Metcalf on a system to send information to, front, and from the lab's computer. In about two years, they had designed the first version of Ethernet, a link that could transmit data at 2.94 megabytes over coax cable. It borrowed in part from a wireless networking system developed at the University of Hawaii called AlohaNet, tapping into Boggs' passion for ham radio. He was the perfect partner for me, Metcalf told the Times. I was more of a concept artist. He was a build the hardware and the backroom engineer. At this point, a networking system called ARPANET already existed, but was designed for connection over longer distances. Ethernet beat out competing technologies for near-proximity connections thanks to its clever packet technology. That allowed data to be sent over wires or wirelessly, and it would continue to work even if some packets were lost. Metcalf eventually founded the Ethernet working giant 3Com, while Boggs stayed at Park as a researcher. He later moved to mini computer giant DEC, then started an Ethernet company called LAN Media. Ethernet became the standard protocol for wired devices in the 80s, 
and is the foundational tech used for Wi-Fi what first proliferated in the 1990s. Nearly 50 years later, it has never been replaced and is ubiquitous in nearly all digital devices. So why did it survive and thrive? Seems Ethernet does not work in theory, only in practice, Boggs once said, Metcalf told the New York Times. It was a memorable moment as the 100-year-old vacuum tubes inside a replica of the transatlantic test transmitter powered a signal that once again spanned an ocean and perhaps even time. For three hours, three museum volunteers put call sign W2AN slash 1BCG on the air, marking the successful completion of repairs done since the replica's activation for the December centennial of the historic December 1921 test. Ed Gable, K2MP, Peter Such, WB2UAQ, and Bill Hopkins, AA2YV, operated for three hours from upstate New York, feeding a T antenna with lots of radials. The moment seemed bright, Ed said, that a very nice thing happened. He said operators crowding the bands in the weekend's 160-meter SSB contest appeared to move aside and made room for the important 375-watt transmission. Some high points include reaching farther west in the U.S. to log W8KGI in New Mexico and crossing the ocean once more, logging OH1XX in Finland and YO2VG in Romania. Ed, the museum's curator emeritus, said this ends the 100-year celebration. He said the transmitter now goes into display mode at the museum and will wake up sometime in someone else's future. A 13-year-old in Germany can now join the rest of her family on the air and celebrate her recent achievement. Friedrich Dutsch, DH9FD, who has become the youngest person to currently hold a Class A radio amateur license. She follows in the footsteps of another bright YL, Laura Bergman, DL2JJ, who is only 10 years old in 2017, when holding her previous call sign of DO9JJ upgraded her license from novice to full, joining both her parents on the air. Friedrich passed her license exam administered by BNETSA, the federal network agency, and now joins her parents and her grandfather as active hams. According to a press release from the DARC, she has been a member of the German Amateur Radio Club since late last year. With her new advanced level of license, she is permitted to transmit on all ham radio frequencies in Germany. Be listening for her on the air. Over 6,500 amateurs reached for the stars last month, but were happy to reach a dwarf planet instead. From February 14th to the 21st, amateur radio operators celebrated the discovery of Pluto by contacting W7P and W7P Slant Zero for the Pluto Anniversary Special Event. This annual countdown will last until the centennial of the discovery in 2030. Most of the operation took place from a trailer at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, where Clyde Tombaugh changed the understanding of our solar system on February 18, 1930. Held in conjunction with the I Heart Pluto Festival at the observatory, the event is in its second year, organized by the Northern Arizona DX Association under the coordination of Bob Wirtz, WF7E. The final tally may show as many as 7,500 contacts were logged by the 18 operators on W7P and 5 operators on W7P Slant Zero, which was led by Doug Tombaugh, the N3PDT, nephew of the famed astronomer. The team was contacted by stations from all 50 U.S. states and 57 countries. For QSL information, look up W7P on the QRZ.com. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 conducted its first test of the newest tool in its emergency communications toolbox on the 26th of February. Stations representing 14 countries around the region included use of the geostationary satellite QO100 as part of their response to a simulated global emergency. There were 22 stations in all, demonstrating how the amateur radio community can be effective, passing messages despite the inevitable language barriers and equipment failures. According to Greg Mossop, G0DUB, the IARU's Emergency Communications Coordinator, the exercise was a success, underscoring how amateur radio stations can respond across a region that stretches from South Africa, north through to Europe, and into the United Kingdom. The next test is planned for later this year in October. Two ARRL Section Manager elections were held during the winter season, and the ballots were counted at ARRL headquarters on Tuesday, February 22nd. In Virginia, 
Jack R. Smith, KE4LWT, of Ruckersville, received 889 votes, and Terry Buzzard, KA8TNF, of Virginia Beach, received 412 votes. Smith was declared elected and will begin his first two-year term on April 1st. Smith has served as an assistant section emergency coordinator for the last two years. He will take the reins of the Virginia Field Organization from Carl Clements, W4CAC. Clements was appointed in mid-December 2021 as interim section manager after the untimely and unfortunate death of section manager Joe Palsa, K3WRY. In North Carolina, Marvin Hoffman, WA4NC of Boone, the incumbent section manager, received 1,235 votes, and Tony Jones, N4ATJ of McCaddenville, received 257 votes. Hoffman was declared re-elected and will begin his second term on April 1, 2022. These incumbent section managers faced no opposition and were declared re-elected and will begin new terms on April 1st. George Miller, W3GWM in Eastern Pennsylvania, John Fritz, K2QY in Eastern New York, John Mark Robertson, K5JMR in Louisiana, Joe Speroni, AH0A in the Pacific Section, Dave Kaltenborn, N8BKC in San Diego, and Chris Stallcamp, KI0D in South Dakota. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Most ham radio clubs have some sort of fundraising event each year. With a little extra effort, you can greatly improve the attendance at your club's next ham fest or other fundraiser. Most radio and TV stations offer free airtime to not-for-profit organizations to promote special events. There are often strict guidelines on submissions to media outlets, but even if you don't know what they are, you can often meet the requirements by submitting your information months ahead of time and wording your announcement correctly. Remember, most media outlets will not call you to get clarifications or proof of not-profit status. It's easier for them to pitch them in the trash than call and confirm the information that you should have included anyway. If you want the free airtime, the burden is on you to have those announcements ready for air when your announcement hits the mail. In this series, we'll create and submit a public service announcement for your local TV and radio stations. Be sure to get your club PR person to pay close attention to this series on This Week in Amateur Radio. First off, we need to put on paper a description of the event we wish to promote, answering all the pertinent questions of who, what, why, where, and when. Be sure to get complete answers to all these questions, assuming the information is being provided to people who know none of the above. Make no assumptions about what your audience may or may not already know, so provide all the information and double check it for accuracy. If your public service announcement or PSA says it's a half mile past Highway 101 to enter the fairgrounds, drive it yourself to be sure that is correct. Leave nothing to chance. Next time, we'll cover the outline for the PSA and putting ink on paper. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with a recap of this week's lead stories from the Southgate Amateur Radio News, here is Steve Richards, G4HPE. Germany's National Society, the DARC, reports in Romania that radio amateurs have been contacted by their government to offer their expertise should the situation deteriorate. The DARC has also provided an update and guidance for German amateurs, and it's good advice for all radio amateurs in Radio Range of Ukraine. The DARC Post says that, as has been reported several times in the past few days, while war is currently raging in Ukraine, the use of amateur radio stations there is currently prohibited. 
The situation is being monitored very closely by the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 and its member countries, and measures to support the refugees are being prepared, particularly in the countries that are on the route of the refugee movements. In Romania, radio amateurs have been contacted by their government, asking them to offer their expertise should the situation deteriorate. In Poland, mobile phone providers are setting up temporary mobile phone stations and refugees are granted free use of mobile phones and trains. Furthermore, Polish radio amateurs have also activated more Winlink gateways to give Ukrainian radio amateurs more options for communication should the cellular networks fail or be switched off. The International Amateur Radio Union has made it clear in a recent statement, however, that, in principle, any radio amateur currently transmitting from Ukraine is risking his or her life. If you hear a Ukrainian station, do not broadcast its call sign location or frequency, whether on the amateur bands, on a DX cluster, or on social media. You may be putting lives at risk. If you do hear a Ukrainian station, advertising the fact should be avoided in all cases. In the current situation, the best thing amateurs can do is listen. We should not try to call Ukrainian radio amateurs. If we happen to hear a Ukraine station calling, we shouldn't cause a pile-up either, just because we fancy working a war-related station. Standard emergency protocol should always be observed. If you hear the words emergency, welfare traffic, or the abbreviation QUF, Quebec Uniform Foxtrot, stop transmitting, listen, and follow a few simple rules. If you receive such traffic, listen carefully and write down everything you hear. Stay on the frequency until it's clear. If you can't help, don't engage, but continue to listen and wait for someone better positioned to help. Don't transmit at all, unless or until you are 100% sure you can help. And you should follow the instructions of the control station. The control station is the station that is handling the emergency or has been designated as such by the station in distress. Keep the exchanges short and to the point. Do not exchange useless information. Roughly follow the emergency call scheme that you will have learned on your first aid course. When did it happen? Where did it happen? What happened? How can we help? And who can help? The emergency information can then be passed on to your local police, who have the appropriate contacts in the relevant foreign office. Of course, you have to explain, calmly and factually, what kind of information you have. Don't panic and stay calm. And always remember that amateur radio is a medium to relay messages. We can, and we do, but no more. In particular, explaining to others how to help is not the communicator's job. If you become involved in searches for missing persons, there is the Red Cross Search Service, which is already active in countries which are experiencing a flow of refugees. Even if the IT systems of the search service are paralysed by a cyber attack, the service is still available. The German Red Cross, the DRK, provides the following information on its website. The concern and fear for family members, friends and acquaintances in Ukraine is unimaginably great. Individual inquiries can be sent to away-migration at drk.de. Once again, that's away-migration at drk.de. Search requests, even if no active search is possible in Ukraine at the moment, are accepted by the DRK Tracing Service, by all DRK Tracing Service advice centres at all DRK association levels. What is not needed are people who think that they are now saving the world with their amateur emergency radio kits and know everything better anyway. Elon Musk's SpaceX Starlink satellites are now active over Ukraine after a request from the embattled country's leadership to replace internet services destroyed by the Russian attack. Vladimir Putin's unprovoked invasion has left parts of the country without internet. SpaceX's plan was always to launch thousands of communication satellites to bring broadband to hard-to-reach areas of the world. Mikhailo Fedorov, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine and Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, asked SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk to help with Starlink Internet, and last Saturday Musk replied, saying that Starlink services were now active in Ukraine, and more ground terminals were en route.
Starlink is a satellite constellation in low Earth orbit, allowing for Internet to blanket anywhere on the Earth. Users on the ground require satellite dishes that connect to the Starlink satellites and ground stations for Internet. Incidentally, Starlink recently also helped Tonga to get back onto the Internet after a volcano severed the island nation's fibre optic cable, taking communications offline. So the situation in Ukraine now means that if Russian troops damage internet communications, government officials will be able to remain online, thanks to the Starlink provision. The Ukrainian president has already received confirmation from SpaceX that the appropriate equipment for broadband internet access via satellite is on the way, and mobile networks are currently also working. So, communication via shortwave is currently not needed. And to repeat the advice regarding amateur radioactivity, the best we can do is listen. The Kiev Independent reports that the frequency of a suspected Russian military shortwave radio broadcast, known as the buzzer for its recognisable repeating channel marker, has become the battleground for rival Russian and Ukrainian radio hams, who have been attempting to hijack the frequency to play memes and propaganda. The UBV-76 transmission, which can be listened to at 4625 kHz on shortwave radio, is suspected to be used by the Russian military for relaying coded messages to military forces. The signal has been transmitting since the late 1970s, during the height of the Cold War. There has been much speculation about the exact purpose of the radio signal. However, according to the Numbers Station Research and Information Center, the most widely accepted theory is that the transmissions are used to send communication between Russia's Western Military District. The radio signals originate from the village of Narofominsk near Moscow. The frequency is allegedly marked by the Russian military with a repeated buzz, which is occasionally interrupted by live coded messages. With tensions between Russia and Ukraine mounting, enthusiasts noted that the encrypted radio messages were becoming much more frequent. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service, at our website at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world,